Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's September 25th, 2017, and we're very excited to bring to you another live Mormon Stories Podcast. Um, I should note at the top of the hour that I'm receiving word that Grant Palmer may have passed away. I don't have a final confirmation of that, but his face... I'm, I'm getting word of that from others, and his Facebook page um, is basically saying, in remembrance of the late Grant Palmer. Um, so, uh, you know, hold off before you for sure um, conclude that, that, in fact, Grant has passed. But uh, whether or not he's passed, our love and our thoughts go to the to Grant Palmer and his family. And if indeed he has passed, we're we just want Grant you to know that we love you and we appreciate you. We're thinking of you uh, in Grant's final uh, lunch that I had with him about a month ago. He he told me that uh, I asked him what he thought about heaven, um, what would happen in heaven. He said he wasn't scared to die. He was eager to be reunited with his first wife in heaven, who he misses and loves. And he said that he thinks that in heaven he'll be a teacher of the gospel of Christ He'll be a gardener because he loves gardening and he'll be able to take care of pigeons because he loves taking care of pigeons. And Grant, if you have passed, uh, I hope you get your wishes. I hope they all come true and many more, but much love to you, Grant uh, Palmer, regardless. Um, today on Mormon Stories podcast, we are going to be continuing our series on uh, drug addiction or opiate addiction and recovery. Um, and I'm very excited to have uh, um, Graham is our guest, and we're going to be talking to Graham in just a second about his story of um, how he came to use uh, harder drugs and uh, how he experienced uh, addiction as a, as a Mormon and his battle with recovery. Before we um, turn to that, I'm going to just make a couple quick announcements. Um, October 27th, we're going to be having a workshop in Salt Lake City on finding spirituality and improving mental health during a faith crisis. It'll be in Utah County. It's a one-day workshop, um, and it's the first time we're going to try this one-day workshop thing where you don't have to worry about finding babysitters necessarily for the evening or finding a place to stay overnight. We're going to try and do a full one-day workshop so October 27th. Uh, we're also doing a half-day workshop in Utah County on November 17th. Uh, dealing with healthy relationships that can include marriages, mixed faith marriages, communicating with believing family and friends, emotional intimacy, et cetera. So um, we're experimenting with these smaller workshops uh, based on demand. So uh, also uh, November 19th, 9th and 10th, we'll be uh, doing a full workshop for Mormon stories in the San Francisco Bay area. And we're accepting nominations for events in 2018. Um, so please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com if you want us to hold an event in your area. And then finally, for those interested, of course, we have our cruise to the Bahamas in October 24th to 28th in the fall of 2018. Our heartfelt love and support go to all those impacted by the hurricanes in the Caribbean. And if uh, for some reason our plans change, we'll let you know. But those are our events. And that is our um, now it's time for our interview with Graham. Um, for those of you who have tuned in uh, live, we have 40 people who have tuned in so far. We want to welcome you to uh, this episode. The reason why we do live interviews and broadcast them is so that we can get uh, support, uh, interaction. We can make these interviews uh, interactive with others. So if any of you have questions about addiction or opiate addiction, drug addiction, if you have questions for Graham, if you have comments or feedback about recovery, uh, we would love for you to post your questions, post your comments, and we can incorporate them into this interview. Uh, that would be great. Um, and so without any further ado, uh, we want to welcome Graham uh, to this podcast. So Graham, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, John. Okay, so uh, for our listeners, this is part two in our series. We've already done one interview. It's going to be released in the next uh, few days. Graham, you're going to be the second interview. So 
Um, maybe if you can, how would you feel about starting with just a little bit about your Mormon story, kind of your Mormon upbringing? To what extent was it a normal Mormon upbringing or a, not a normal Mormon upbringing? Yeah, so you know, I would consider my upbringing pretty, pretty typical, pretty straight-laced Mormon. Um, we went to church every Sunday for all three hours, and it was never a question of whether we are or we're not going to go to church. It was just what happened, and we're all happy to do it. Um, you know, I attended Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and was always super active in that program, um, you know, in my youth at least. And, you know, there was about as as a straight edge Mormon as you uh, would consider someone caffeinated sodas were never never a thing in our household okay so so kind of an orthodox upbringing would you say yeah I'd say pretty pretty orthodox um, we never did anything other than church on Sundays my parents would never work on Sundays uh, wouldn't watch movies other than those Book of Mormon animated series uh, pretty much was the only entertainment on Sundays. What state, what state were you raised in mostly? Uh, Southern California is where okay. I was raised. Okay. Um, talk about your, you know, love for the church. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you like it? sort of in your ch childhood and teen years, what did the church mean to you personally? So it was, it was just who I was. It, it was all I knew and my whole kind of basis of how I viewed the world was church oriented. Um, it, it, I always identify myself as a, uh, the the Mormon kid because I was in a place where there, you know, it wasn't Utah, it wasn't Idaho, it was fairly sparse Mormon wise. Um, you know, it wasn't like I was the only one in my school. We had maybe a hundred people, maybe a hundred people, yeah, um, who were Mormons in my school. But in my group of friends, I was the Mormon kid, and my friends knew that, and. They knew that I didn't drink coffee and tea. They never really asked why. They never asked about it kind of thing. Um, I think it was a big part of how I viewed myself and how I viewed my future, too. Um, you know, going on a mission was just something that was going to happen. You know, it wasn't a question of, uh, am I going to do it? Am I not going to do it? It was, well, when I turn 19, that's what will happen. Right. What uh, did you have? Do you feel like you had a testimony growing up? And if so, what was your testimony based on? And what were your favorite parts about being a Mormon? Um, I did have a testimony. It wasn't something I ever thought twice about. I was a pretty shy kid, so I was never the type to go up on fast and testimony day and bear my testimony. Um, but it, I never questioned the doctrine of the church. Um, that was just, it, it wasn't even a thought to question it, um, if that makes sense. Sure. What did prayer mean to you? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, we, our family always prayed before meals and we, prayed before we go on road trips and I'd I'd say I was probably pretty good about you know praying before I go to bed kind of thing. Um, and I I thought I knew as a kid that someone was listening to me. And that was it was I don't know. I know I keep saying this, but like questioning, it was so far out of the realm of like even a thought. Like that was, that sure. was just how it was. 
So did you kind of take comfort and belief in God that you had a loving Heavenly Father who took care of you yeah, kind of thing? And, um, yeah, it made life, uh, it gave a format to my life and it gave, um, it gave hope of uh, happy and long life because I saw you know, people at church living happy and fulfilling lives in the church. I saw it, I saw it as the whole concept of eternal life and like reaching that goal sounded awesome. Like, I don't know why anyone wouldn't want that. Um, yeah. Sure. What were your favorite parts about being Mormon? Um, You know, I had some, my best friend growing up was Mormon. He lived around the corner from me. Um, and I was, I think he was probably in a different, at some point I moved and we were in different wards. But my closest friend was this Mormon kid and he remained close friends with me for a long time. So I had that kind of social connection, at least when I was young. Um, to the church, and I enjoyed scouting, and I enjoyed uh, camp out, and I enjoyed scout camp. Um, it, it was, I guess, more the, the social aspects I enjoyed as a younger kid. Social aspects. Okay. Um, did your ward feel like a family to you? So, I mean, I, I'd say so. I had some, from about the time I was, let me think, probably about nine or 10 years old, I was in the same ward up until the time I graduated high school. And the ward I was in was a, had a smaller group of youth. Um, it was kind of a, a lot of older couples with fairly limited youth, kind of people my age at least. I think that may have changed a little bit in recent years. Some more young people moved in. Okay. Um, so I, yeah. So talk about um, how in the world you would start using using drugs as a Mormon kid that kind of was in a family that didn't even allow caffeine or use caffeine and who kind of really believed in the church and would never question it. How does that happen? Um, so I've tried to spend, you know, some time looking back and trying to figure out where my earliest, uh, where that kind of earliest thought kind of crept into my life. And it basically revolved around about my junior year in high school, um, 16, 17 years old or so. And I was kind of somewhat dating, but not dating this Mormon girl. Um, and that ended poorly, to say the least. And from that point, I kind of didn't want anything to do with Mormonism. Like in that, in that breakup, I kind of shunned everything that she stood for. Um, and you know, I, it was my first pseudo relationship as a kid. I was young and thought I was in love with this girl. And you know, it, it, uh, that first breakup's always, pretty tough on a kid when they're trying to figure out who they are in life and you know later high school years are pretty formative in a kid's life I think sure so the, are you saying the breakup kind of caused you to question your faith a little bit or um it it led me to not necessarily question the faith I still believed it but didn't want to practice it 
Okay. So I, I still you know, went to church all the time and still completely believed it, but um, found ways to uh, you know, justify in my own head that, well, I could still believe it and you know, try weed or try drinking. Um, so there was a lot, of, a lot of mess going on in my head at that time. Okay. So you, so you started, did you start with alcohol? Did you start with smoking or did you start with, with just actual, actual drugs? Um, so really the first, I mean, I had taken opiates maybe around 15 or 16 after a surgery. Uh Um, I had a sinus surgery because I pretty prone to sinus infections um, and I, I, from what I recall, I generally took them as prescribed, um, but I also enjoyed it. They feel good, but it was never anything that I was kind of seeking out. So really the first thing I tried was smoking weed. And that was during my senior year of high school, um, a little after I turned 18 years old. What was that like to to try marijuana as a devout believing Mormon? Um, so I guess you know between sixteen and eighteen years old, I kind of started being a little more rebellious in my actions, um, you know, sneaking out at night with friends, not doing drugs or anything, but wandering around town or driving around to the beach at 2 a.m. Um, so just dumb things that all kind of just led up to being slightly more rebellious. And the next logical step was trying marijuana. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, you know, at the time, it didn't seem like that big of a deal because, you know, I had been doing all these little rebellious things kind of leading up to that for the you know, couple of years prior. So it wasn't this big. There just wasn't a whole lot of guilt associated with it. Like I kind of expected there to be. Um it was just, well, that happened, and that's that. Sure. And did, so did, did you find that, you know, what role did, did the marijuana play for you? Um, so at first, it was, it was just fun. It was recreational. It, it was something to do with my Know, high school friends on weekends. Um, it came to so also also somewhere in that sixteen to eighteen year old range. Um, I started having panic attacks, but serious enough to the point where I ended up seeing a psychiatrist to see what they wanted to do, and I was prescribed. Um, believe Ativan at first, which is a benzo. It's like Xanax, but a little bit longer at lasting. Um, and it's kind of designed for anxiety and panic attacks. So I was taking that kind of irregularly for, you know, a couple of years um, as needed. And at some point I stopped taking that and using marijuana seemed to be just as effective in kind of helping mediate panic attacks. Um, so, so it became less recreational and more like, I know I've said this in jest before, but it's more medicinal than, than recreational. And in California at the time, that that was a legitimate and legal use for marijuana. Um, 
in my mind, a, a safer alternative to, you know, some of those prescription medications too. Okay. And so that was around what age that you started taking it medicinally? Um, around about 18 to 19. So uh, senior year of high school and then kind of leading into college. And did you hide it from your parents or did they know or? So I did my best to hide it. There was one time that they found out. I forgot who, some friend of a friend of mine, I think casually mentioned to them that they knew I was smoking weed. Um, so they brought that up to me and it was awful. And I went to go confess to my bishop at the time because that's, that's what you do. Um, but I also didn't stop smoking weed after I confessed to my bishop. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, it was more of a gesture of getting my parents off my back than it was actually feeling bad and repentant about it. Okay. Um, do you, um, some people say that marijuana isn't addictive and I don't claim to totally understand what that might mean or not mean. What, what would your response to that sort of be? What was it like for you? Did you find it to be addictive, not addictive? What would you say? I, it's a, a fuzzy area because myself, I wouldn't consider it to be, you know, addictive. I didn't find myself addicted to it, but I've also met people who've had, serious uh, problems as a result of using it too much. So it's, it's tough to put a blanket statement on it like the marijuana activists tend to do, that it's not addictive, um, because really anything can be addictive in a way. It's just how you use it and when you use it and why you use it and how you manage your life around using it. And um, what, and if you would have described why you're using it and how often you're using it, what would it be at, um, at that time, at that time? At that time, I would say it was uh, basically for medicinal use. Um, it just the chronic, the chronic, my, chronic pain? for just anxiety, really. Okay. Um, and it helped me sleep at night. I've had sleep issues for a long time. So it also helped me get to sleep at night. Okay. Um, all right. So, and again, I'm, I'm guessing it didn't affect your, your, your belief still stayed strong. You just weren't as into the church and you felt okay you know, using a little bit? Is that, is that fair to say? Um, yeah, my, my beliefs, the, the truth of the church wasn't a question still at that point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that the foundational claims, the truth claims of the church were still as true as they ever had been in my mind. Okay. Um, yeah. And did you a feel lot, a lot of, a lot of guilt? Of justification you... in my head, I think. Yeah, how'd you justify it? Um, at least with the marijuana, I justified it as being as being medicine. And since a doctor prescribed it to me in a way, it was not illegal. And I felt that within the church's guidelines, you know, I had kind of tried the standard medicine that a doctor would give you and that wasn't great for me. So I tried an alternative medicine for a doctor and I thought, you know, if, if it's legal and a doctor saying it's okay, I should be able to do it within 
the realm of the church. Cool. So, and I think that's still true today. I think, as I understand it, there are Mormons everywhere that are using medical marijuana to treat some sort of condition and their bishops are fine with it. So I don't think medicinal marijuana in 2017 is considered against the word of wisdom by the LDS church. That's my impression. Is that your impression? That, that I mean, it makes sense within, within the framework of the church. I think, yeah, I would say that it should be okay. It, it makes sense to me that it would be okay. Yeah. Because what's the difference between marijuana and some big pharma chemical drug that you're using for whatever reason? It's all different ways to medicate, right? Yeah. There's tons of ways to treat the same ailment and whatever works. So tell me, Graham, how you progressed from uh, medicinal use to sort of the use of hard drugs and addiction, and then talk about Maybe um, if, if BYU slash mission service fell in the middle there at all. Yes. So up until, uh, so yeah, all the way. So, okay. After high school, I went to BYU for my freshman year um, and up and up all through Freshman year, marijuana and alcohol were the only things that I had tried or used, I believe. Yeah, so my my mindset towards the church didn't really change during my beginning of my time at BYU, at least. Um, then I turned 19 at the beginning of my kind of fall of my freshman year so near the beginning and my parents kind of started asking about turning in my papers and you know getting ready to go on a mission they were you know aware at least a little bit of my drug use in high school they didn't know anything else was still going on um so I ended up talking with a a therapist at BYU to kind of help flush out my thoughts and figure out how I should bring this up with my parents that I wasn't, wasn't going to go on a mission. Um, and so we kind of worked through some things at some point I let them know that you know, I couldn't justify teaching people something that I, didn't live um, and something that I wasn't a hundred percent sure about. Um, so it, so it, it was this kind of conversation with my parents, mostly over email, I believe while I was at BYU kind of trying to flush these things out with them. And it, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't pretty for a while. And meaning, meaning, your parents weren't very happy. Yeah, they. I must have told them that I also wasn't planning on coming back to BYU somewhere in there, um, which is also you know, another big blow because they don't. That, that was my plan, go on a mission, come back to BYU, and then graduate. My parents had both graduated from BYU, and I had a sister who attended BYU, graduated BYU. So it was, it was just that that was the expectation within the church. That was the expectation of my life. And that's all I knew, and that's all I... Even then, when I was questioning whether I wanted to live the teachings of the church, I never thought what the alternative would be for my life. So I never thought what it might be like to not go on a mission. 
our life plan basically ends it at, you know, mission and BYU, if that makes sense. So in other words, you'd been planning your whole life to do BYU mission and then career afterwards. But now that BYU and mission didn't happen, you're stuck just wondering if you had a future and what that might be. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 That's, that's, um, that's basically it. Um, My, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So just real, real quick. Um, a lot of Mormon youth experience severe guilt and shame as teens and adults for either masturbation or sexual activity in some way, uh, or, uh, you know, making mistakes. And then, of course, I can imagine that deciding not to go on a mission and dropping out of BYU would bring you a lot of shame and guilt, potentially. Talk about the role of shame and guilt in your Mormon life, you know, all along the way from your teen years up. Did you, were you racked with shame and guilt up through your BYU years or not? And then did your decision not to go to BYU and on a mission cause a lot of shame and guilt? Um, so as, um, so as a kid, you know, the only thing that I ever recall feeling guilty of doing was masturbating. Like that was, that was the only thing that in my younger years of my behavior that was out, out of line with the church. Um, and it, it wasn't the, you know, all I knew about you know, anything sexual at all was that it was forbidden and it's going to ruin your life and it's addictive and it's unhealthy and it's awful. Um, so it was, it was me fighting with, well, this is awesome. Why isn't, this okay versus I'm going to spend eternity in outer darkness because of it. So it was something that at least probably through, you know, middle school, early high school was, was something I was ashamed of really is probably the right word for it. Um, now I would, if anyone asked, I would never admit to, to masturbating because that's that I just viewed it as everyone knew I was Mormon and everyone knew that I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Um, but I just never, never thought outside of the Mormon bubble. I never thought that, well, this is probably healthy and okay. Like everyone probably does this. Um, it was always associated with the negative emotions and not, it was associated with out of the norm. It wasn't something, it wasn't something that a good Mormon should do was what's going through my mind. Sure. But not tormented. Like you wouldn't, it wouldn't be accurate maybe for you to say that that early drug use was in some way to medicate the guilt and shame that Mormonism gave you. That was what our first interviewee sort of, uh, you know, along with having been sexually abused, it sounds like guilt and shame wasn't a source of massive torment and pain and anguish for you through your BYU time. I, right? I, I wouldn't say it was, no, it was more, um, it was more either acting out against and at least in the first case, that early ex-girlfriend um, or is acting out against, you, you know, my, my parents are acting out against later on another ex-girlfriend. So it was less associated with guilt or trying to, you know, medicate the guilt and more associated with rebellion. Okay. So talk about how you went from leaving BYU to sort of, uh, and not going on a mission to trying the harder drugs and then drug addiction. How did that progress? So 
when I left BYU, I moved, moved back to San Diego with a, a Mormon-ish friend of mine uh, who was also no longer practicing Mormon. And me and him and some friends got an apartment together uh, down in Southern California. And it was maybe five or six of us in a two bedroom apartment. It was basically weed and alcohol all the time. And eventually that kind of led to experimenting with things like, probably the next thing I tried after that was either cocaine or LSD. Um, would have been all during that time in that apartment. It was all recreational. It was all someone would get a hold of it and we'd try it once and that's it. Or we'd, or yeah, so it was all recreational at first. It was all a big party and it was all fun. It was all, you know, harmless in our thought. Sure. Um, yeah, cocaine's a pretty so, serious step, right? Um, I thought, you know, it, growing up, I thought cocaine was awful and terrible and you know, the worst thing out there. And eventually I convinced myself that it was just another party drug. It was just like smoking weed or having a drink, um, which it's not it's fairly fairly serious in terms of you know addiction potential and there's always danger in illegal drugs because you never know what you, know, you never know what you're getting you never know where it came from so that that was probably the next big step was justifying that and you hear about so so you would say looking back well, well, first of all, some people like to say that marijuana is a gateway drug, and then others are insistent that marijuana is not a gateway drug. What would you say uh, in your experience? Would you say marijuana became for you a slippery slope that led to the, the harder drugs? Um, for myself, I wouldn't say so. Uh, after BYU, you know, at the beginning of the time in our apartment back in Southern California, I eventually stopped smoking weed pretty much. Um, you know, I still drink and still tried other things, but I didn't stop smoking weed because it wasn't working or I didn't like it or I, it was curiosity and it was was fun we just never really thought ahead um, we I wouldn't say for me that it was a gateway drug no weed dealer ever offered me heroin but like as a it's sort of like well I'll try marijuana and wow it makes me feel really good makes you want to try other things. What about from that perspective? Um, I mean, I, I guess I could see some of that in myself. But I think a lot of it also had to do with the my change in perspective of how I viewed marijuana from being a Mormon who thought smoking was the worst thing in the world to you know, kind of realizing that marijuana is really not that bad for most people. Um, so kind of realizing that the church and, you know, the DARE drug programs in middle school were all way overblowing uh, the effects and the, the consequences of using marijuana. Like, well, if they weren't that truthful about marijuana, why should I trust them on the other things? Um, 
so yeah, marijuana was fun. It was great. And curiosity led me to, you know, experiment in a way. So cocaine and LSD, I do have, I know that in the post-Mormon community, uh, experiments with hallucinogens like LSD or mushrooms, uh, that's something that, that uh, I see with some frequency. Mm-hmm. Um, is that again, is that something, so it sounds like you're saying cocaine was not good. Do you, is that, is that fair Um, to say that, that, that you think cocaine is just a flat out mistake or not? For me, someone with, you know, anxiety and panic problems to begin with probably wasn't a good idea to, you know, meddle in something that's going to likely make all of that worse. Um, what about just so the addictive? Was, what about just the addictive properties of it? The danger of it? Um, I think that the anxiety it gave me negated any positive effects that it might have had. So okay. yeah, I was I was scared before, but I also wasn't worried that I would enjoy it enough to be addicted to it. Okay, so for you, you're saying cocaine wasn't addictive. For me, yeah. If you if you had adult children and they're like, "Dad, should I try it or not?" What what would you say? It's up to you, or would you say, "Stay away"? I mean, I I wouldn't condone breaking the law, but I also wouldn't call the cops on them if they said they had done that. I guess I'm just saying, having been through this, I'm guessing there's going to be some things where you're like, you know what, it depends on the situation. And then other things you're just going to say, nope, stay away from that. It's bad. I'm not hearing you say that for cocaine or LSD. Is that true? Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be happy and I wouldn't condone anyone using cocaine. I think that's a lot more of a slippery slope than marijuana or hallucinogens can be. Okay. Um, So I I say definitely that's in a different class than some others. So for you, there's a place maybe for medical or responsible marijuana or even hallucinogenic use, cocaine sort of outside the realm of what you feel like is likely going to be a good experience for people. Yeah, it's that's definitely in a different category outside the realm of um, okay. helpful Got or, it. you know, kind of brush it off kind of thing. So tell us how it advanced after after LSD and cocaine. So uh, there was, you know, a handful of occasions when I would have tried ecstasy but that was also, you know, I'd put in the same category as cocaine. It was fine, but it wasn't life-changing, and I wouldn't condone it for anyone else. Um, so I lived in that, that apartment with all those people for about a little over a year. And... I guess I should probably clarify during all that year time, I was working, you know, at least one full-time job. So none of my drug use at all ever got in the way of, you know, living my life and paying my rent and working 40 to 60 hours a week. Um, So it never interfered with my my personal life and never interfered with my work life. So that's probably an important clarification to make, at least for that, uh, that year of my life. Um, and at the end of that, I moved to Northern California um, and decided to go back to school. So I had left you know, all those Southern California friends and 
moved up with some family in Northern California. Um, and by then I was not smoking weed at all. Um, and I was drinking, I wouldn't say regularly, but I was drinking a couple times a week, maybe. Um, and this would have been right around the time I, probably shortly after I turned 20. So it's still not legal for me to drink at the time. Um, yeah, so I went to school in Northern California and didn't really have any friends up there. I had family up there, but, and once I kind of delved back into schoolwork, even the drinking took a backseat for a little bit, um, just because I needed to focus on school. I was going to school full time. At some point, I got a job on top of that. Um, so there really, wasn't a whole lot of time to be messing around with drinking or drugs. So the first year up in San Francisco was pretty, pretty mild, I'd say. Um, then it would have been at some point while I was up there, I had been dating this girl from Southern California since the end of high school. Uh, and at some point while I was up there, we broke up and I didn't take that too well. Um, so this was kind of a, probably another big turning point, I'd say. Uh, so at that time, I was 21. So yeah, I'd been there about a year. We broke up. Uh, it had been a three-year relationship, and I was not ready for it to end. And I kind of lashed out by drinking heavily and kind of stopped taking care of my health. And that resulted in me getting fairly sick and ending up in the hospital a handful of times uh, while I was up in San Francisco. So I guess part of the story here is that I have a disease called cystic fibrosis, which is a lung disease and a digestive di disease. Uh, and it makes me prone to, you know, lung infections and sickness in general, um, you know, a lot more than your average person. So I stopped taking care of my lungs and ended up in the hospital, um, again, with lung infection, sinus infections. And at some point in there, I was prescribed some sort of opiate. Um, I'm trying to think what it was. It would have been, I think it was, I think it was oxycodone. A really low dose, but a pretty serious opiate for you know, headaches at least. That's what I was taking them for. Um, Yeah, so this was all Yeah, where was I? So yeah, I uh, wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't I wouldn't say I was trying to make myself sick. But I also just didn't care anymore. Like I enjoyed being drunk at class or at work. Um, I enjoyed taking opiates at work or in class. 
Um, so my, my school performance started slipping a, a little bit. Um, I stopped showing up to some classes and I stopped doing work for classes. And it was all just this combination of working too much, being sick, and not caring that all kind of piled up all at once while I was living up there in San Francisco. Um, yeah. Uh, so I guess... So I guess, so in relation to the church at this point, I remember that when I first moved up there, uh, I, my parents must have transferred my records to whatever ward I was living up there because I started getting calls from home teachers or elders quorum or someone at some point um, and inviting me to church. And there was... Got his name. Reese. I don't know, he's Bob Reese. Bob maybe? Reese. Bob Reese, yeah. Yeah. I think he was in my he was in my ward boundaries up there, and I met with him a couple times just because he knew that I had told him that I was not really into the church anymore. Um, that I didn't buy into it. And you know, I met with him a couple of times and he was kind of an interesting guy to talk to, but I also kind of brushed him off because I just didn't want to deal with the church at this point. Um, like I hadn't really questioned the truth of the church. I mean, I had thought about it, but I just shut it out of my life. Um, just to kind of give a little bit of reference for where my Mormon brain is at during all of this. Um, yeah. And so how did things go from just occasional opiate use to addiction? And what was that like for you? Um, so the for a while, I really disliked opiates, um, kind of all through high school. I mean, they were, they felt good, but I never overly enjoyed them. They made me feel weird. They made me feel kind of nauseous. Um, so at, at some point, something s kind of just switched in my outlook, and I realized that you know, if I, instead of just eating the pill, if I wanted to crush it up and snort it or, you know, something else, then it actually felt pretty good. Um, so it started with that prescription for the headaches. And eventually my doctor said that she didn't want to prescribe that anymore because it was dangerous. And... Oh, I think this is probably fairly common in the addiction community, but I s decided that you know, heroin was cheaper and, you know, theoretically stronger than buying pills on the street. And I you know, found a guy and started using heroin. And this would have been when I was about 21 or so, right tail end of 21. Um, and it, even at that time, the jump from taking pills to using heroin didn't seem like that big of a progression to me in my mind at the time. Like they had been such little, like tiny steps leading up to that in my life that changing from snorting opiate pills to using heroin was just 
another tiny progression. Um, so I think that kind of might have mitigated any kind of guilt or shame that you, you know, one might think that would be associated with that. Because um, it was all these little concessions along the way. Um, you know, if I did this, well, you know, this isn't that different. If I did that, this really isn't that much different. That's kind of the slippery um, slope idea, right? That's kind of yeah slippery slope, right? It's just little steps. Yeah, and that's really what what played out in my life. I might, I didn't notice it at the time because I just wasn't paying attention or wasn't even considering that that's a thought. You know, looking back, it it was kind of this slow progression into something I never thought I would be. Um, and, you know, once, once heroin came into my life, I never, like that, my focus shifted to that only. Like that's what I was going to be doing. That's how I'm going to spend my time. That's how I'm going to spend my money. Um, Cause it was so much easier to, do that than to deal with feeling sad about a breakup or being stressed about school or about uh, being, you know, irritated that I'm getting sick all the time. Any worry, any anxiety, any fear I might have had about anything took a backseat. Um, so it, it gave me this narrow minded focus and it in a weird way, it gave me a purpose and it gave me, it gave me an identity again, really. Um, you know, all that time I'd been kind of, I had been the Mormon kid when I was young or I had been the kid with CF or I had been, uh, you know, the, the kid who smokes weed all the time or, you know, and then it, it I found this identity that I, enjoyed and it turned into well this is what my life is now and I was okay with that in a 